Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We are in our My Perspectives volume, page 360, 361 and following. We now will look at the Brown versus Board of Education opinion of the court crafted by Earl Warren. Few decisions of the Supreme Court have had such an important influence and effect in American thought, certainly uh, for all of us as we're thinking now about school itself and education. And in some ways, you could make the argument that all of our study in junior English has gone really pointed from and towards this, uh, this classic decision. Why? Because we are our education, aren't we, in some profound and fundamental way, and therefore all Americans had to have the right to a, uh, an education and that, was, that was equal in every way. So we're now going to uh, turn to this reading. I want you to pay attention to the way in which the argument is presented here, making notes in your volume, we'll be working now with professional reader. Brown v. Board of Education, Opinion of the Court, by Earl Warren. Legal Opinion. Background. In 1951, when 17 states required schools to be segregated by race, Thirteen parents brought a lawsuit against the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. At the forefront of the case was the Brown family. Linda Brown, an African-American third grader, was not allowed to attend the elementary school seven blocks from her house. Instead, she was required to take a bus to a school across town. Since the United States Supreme Court decision in the 1896 case Plessy v. Ferguson, Racial segregation of schools had been allowed so long as the schools were separate but equal. In the landmark case of Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously, 9-0, to zero, to reverse Plessy. About the author. Earl Warren, born 1891, died 1974, a lawyer and three-time governor of California, served as the 14th Chief Justice of the United States from 1953 to 1969. Warren's time on the court was an active one, with landmark decisions in race relations, criminal procedure, and legislative apportionment. After the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, Warren headed a federal commission that investigated the murder. Page 361. Brown v. Board of Education, Opinion of the Court, by Earl Warren. Segregation of white and Negro children in the public schools of a state solely on the basis of race pursuant to state laws permitting or requiring such segregation, denies to Negro children the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors of white and Negro schools may be equal. Page 362. A. The history of the 14th Amendment is inconclusive as to its intended effect on public education. B. The question presented in these cases must be determined not on the basis of conditions existing when the 14th Amendment was adopted, but in the light of the full development of public education and its present place in American life throughout the nation. Mark that. C. Where a state has undertaken to provide an opportunity for an education in its public schools, such an opportunity is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. D. Segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race deprives children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal. E. The separate but equal doctrine adopted in Plessy v. Ferguson 163 U.S. 537 has no place in the field of public education. Mark that. F. The cases are restored to the docket for further argument on specified questions relating to the forms of the decrees. Opinion. Mr. Chief Justice Warren delivered the opinion of the court. These cases come to us from the states of Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia and Delaware. They are premised on different facts and different local conditions, but a common legal question justifies their consideration together in this consolidated opinion. In 
each of the cases, minors of the Negro race, through their legal representatives, seek the aid of the courts in obtaining admission to the public schools of their community on a non-segregated basis. In each instance, they had been denied admission to schools attended by white children under laws requiring or permitting segregation according to race. This segregation was alleged to deprive the plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws under the 14th Amendment. In each of the cases, other than the Delaware case, a three-judge federal district court denied relief to the plaintiffs. On the so-called separate but equal doctrine announced by this court in Plessy v. Ferguson, 163 U.S. 537. Separate but equal, Mark. Under that doctrine, equality of treatment is accorded when the races are provided substantially equal facilities, even though these facilities be separate. In the Delaware case, the Supreme Court of Delaware adhered to that doctrine, but ordered that the plaintiffs be admitted to the white schools because of their superiority to the Negro schools. The plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be made equal, and that hence, they are deprived of the equal protection of the laws. You mark that. Because of the obvious importance of the question presented, the court took jurisdiction. Argument was heard in the 1952 term, and re-argument was heard this term on certain questions propounded by the court. Page 363. Re-argument was largely devoted to the circumstances surrounding the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868. It covered exhaustively consideration of the amendment in Congress, ratification by the states, then existing practices in racial segregation, and the views of proponents and opponents of the amendment. This discussion and our own investigation convince us that, although these sources cast some light, it is not enough to resolve the problem with which we are faced. Mark. At best, they are inconclusive. The most avid proponents of the post-war amendments undoubtedly intended them to remove all legal distinctions among all persons born or naturalized in the United States. Their opponents just as certainly were antagonistic to both the letter and the spirit of the amendments and wished them to have the most limited effect. Mark that. What others in Congress and the state legislatures had in mind cannot be determined with any degree of certainty. An additional reason for the inconclusive nature of the amendment's history with respect to segregated schools is the status of public education at that time. In the South, the movement toward free common schools, supported by general taxation, had not yet taken hold. Education of white children was largely in the hands of private groups. Education of Negroes was almost non-existent, and practically all of the race were illiterate. Mark that. In fact, any education of Negroes was forbidden by law in some states. Mark that. Today, in contrast, many Negroes have achieved outstanding success in the arts and sciences, as well as in the business and professional world. It is true that public school education at the time of the amendment had advanced further in the North, but the effect of the amendment on Northern states was generally ignored in the congressional debates. Even in the North, the conditions of public education did not approximate those existing today. The curriculum was usually rudimentary. Mark that. Ungraded schools were common in rural areas. The school term was but three months a year in many states. Mark that. And compulsory school attendance was virtually unknown. As a consequence, it is not surprising that there should be so little in the history of the 14th Amendment relating to its intended effect on public education. In the first cases in this court construing the 14th Amendment, decided shortly after its adoption, the court interpreted it as prescribing all state-imposed discriminations against the Negro race. The doctrine of separate but equal did not make its appearance in this court until 1896 in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, Supra, involving not education, but transportation. Mark that. American courts have since labored with the doctrine for over half a century. Page in this court, there have been six cases involving the separate but equal doctrine in the field of public education. Incoming v. County Board of Education, 175 U.S. 528, and Gong Lum v. Rice, 275 U.S. 78. 
The validity of the doctrine itself was not challenged. In more recent cases, all on the graduate school level, inequality was found in that specific benefits enjoyed by white students were denied to Negro students of the same educational qualifications. Missouri X Relatione, Gaines v. Canada, 305 U.S. 337. Sipuel v. Oklahoma, 332 U.S. 631. Sweat v. Painter, 339 U.S. 629. McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents, 339 U.S. 637. In none of these cases was it necessary to re-examine the doctrine to grant relief to the Negro plaintiff. And in Sweat v. Painter, Supra, the court expressly reserved decision on the question whether Plessy v. Ferguson should be held inapplicable to public education. In the instant cases, that question is directly presented. Here, unlike Sweat v. Painter, there are findings below that the Negro and white schools involved have been equalized or are being equalized with respect to buildings, curricula, qualifications, and salaries of teachers, and other tangible factors. Our decision, therefore, cannot turn on merely a comparison of these tangible factors in the Negro and white schools involved in each of the cases. Mark that. We must look instead to the effect of segregation itself on public education. Circle the word effect. In approaching this problem, we cannot turn the clock back to 1868, when the amendment was adopted, or even to 1896, when Plessy v. Ferguson was written. We must consider public education in the light of its full development and its present place in American life throughout the nation. Mark that. Only in this way can it be determined if segregation in public schools deprives these plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws. Today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Mark that. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. Mark it. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Mark it. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Right. Such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. Circle the word right. We come then to the question presented, does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does. Circle that. In Sweat v. Painter, Supra, in finding that a segregated law school for Negroes could not provide them equal educational opportunities, this court relied in large part on those qualities which are incapable of objective measurement, but which make for greatness in a law school. Page 365. In McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents, Supra, the court, in requiring that a Negro admitted to a white graduate school be treated like all other students, again resorted to intangible considerations, his ability to study, to engage in discussions, and exchange views with other students, and, in general, to learn his profession. Such considerations apply with added force to children in grade and high schools. Mark that. To separate them from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority Circle as it. to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. Mark it. The effect of this separation on their educational opportunities was well stated by finding in the Kansas case by a court which nevertheless felt compelled to rule against the Negro plaintiffs. Segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. Mark that. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of the law. For the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. 
A sense of inferiority affects the motivation of a child to learn. Mark that. Segregation with the sanction of law, therefore, has a tendency to retard the educational and mental development of Negro children and to deprive them of some of the benefits they would receive in a racially integrated school system. Whatever may have been the extent of psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy v. Ferguson, this finding is amply supported by modern authority. Any language in Plessy v. Ferguson contrary to this finding is rejected. Mark it. We conclude that, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Mark it. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This disposition makes unnecessary any discussion whether such segregation also violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Because these are class actions, because of the wide applicability of this decision, and because of the great variety of local conditions, the formulation of decrees in these cases presents problems of considerable complexity. Mark that. On re-argument, the consideration of appropriate relief was necessarily subordinated to the primary question, the constitutionality of segregation in public education. We have now announced that such segregation is a denial of the equal protection of the laws. 366. In order that we may have the full assistance of the parties in formulating decrees, the cases will be restored to the docket, and the parties are requested to present further argument on questions 4 and 5, previously propounded by the court for the re-argument this term. The Attorney General of the United States is again invited to participate. The attorneys general of the states requiring or permitting segregation in public education will also be permitted to appear as amici curiae upon request to do so by September 15, 1954, and submission of briefs by October 1, 1954. It is so ordered. And in this moment... Together with number two, Briggs et al. v. Elliott et al., on appeal from the United States District Court for the Eastern District of South Carolina, Argued December 9th to 10th, 1952. Re-argued December 7th to 8th, 1953. Number 4, Davis et al. v. County School Board of Prince Edward County, Virginia et al. On appeal from the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. And in this moment, America will forever change, right? It's such a compelling, compelling moment in educational history, in American history and thought. I want you to turn now to page 366 and the question sets, and then we'll come back to have a good discussion, I hope, on this amazing piece of legislation. Thank you.